Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the True Blue Crime Podcast. My name is Dan and as always I will be your host for this episode. And for this episode we head back to flyover country and back to the state of North Dakota. I found a rather recent case that should be a good case study in crime scene investigation and a plan for murder so sit back and enjoy. But before we get to the story itself let's cover the business. If you'd like to get updates about what the podcast is up to please like and follow the True Blue Crime Productions Facebook page. More information can be found at the show's website at www.truebluecrimeproductions.com. And if you'd like to email the host directly, my email is truebluecrimeproductions at gmail.com. If you can, please support the show via Patreon or PayPal. Links to make donations are on the website at truebluecrimeproductions.com. And any donation level helps and will help ensure I can keep making free episodes of the podcast and expand the podcast in the future. Any donations will receive a shout-out in a future podcast, a thank you message from the host, and some True Blue Crime merch. For no cost whatsoever, please rate and review the show on whatever platform you're listening to on. Thanks so much, and without any further ado, let's dive into this episode of True Blue Crime. In 1803, the very young nation of America purchased 828,000 square miles of land from the French for the cost of $15 million. America had struck the deal at exactly the right time as Napoleon Bonaparte was looking for funding to expand the French Empire in Europe and cared little about the expansive frontier lands in the continental United States. Originally, America had only hoped to buy western Florida and the area of New Orleans for roughly $10 million, but they were able to acquire a giant portion of the land in North America for only an additional $5 million. Even when inflation is taken into account, the deal would cost the equivalent of 50 cents an acre in today's value, an absolute steal by any valuation. In 1804, a team led by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark was sent by Thomas Jefferson to explore the newly purchased land. The team built a fort and spent the winter of 1804 to 1805 in North Dakota, along the Missouri River, just north of present-day Bismarck, North Dakota. In 1872, settlers arriving in the area located the river crossing spot used by the expedition and started a permanent settlement at the site of a Native American village. Eventually, the railroad came through the area, and the town of Bismarck was named after the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, with the hope of attracting a large number of German immigrants to the area for work and to secure some German funding for the railroads. The town grew even more with the discovery of gold in the Black Hills and an increase in settlers led to more tension with Native Americans in the area, and several skirmishes that were part of the Sioux Wars took place in North Dakota. In 1883, Bismarck was selected to be the capital of the Dakota Territories, and in 1889, it was chosen as the capital of the new state of North Dakota. As of 2022, it is the second most populous city in North Dakota, with a population of 75,000 people, and its metro area, which includes several towns on the city borders, increases the area population to 134,000. The low population and relative isolation keeps Bismarck's crime rate relatively low compared to other Midwest urban areas, but crime can strike anywhere. On the afternoon of January 2nd, 2020, a suspicious house fire on the outskirts of Bismarck, North Dakota would lead to a murder investigation with many twists and turns. This is the case of the murder of Chad Ensel. On 5.20 p.m. on January 2nd, 2020, a 911 call from Nikki Ensel started an investigation into a house fire that included arson, possible suicide, an affair, and finally a murder investigation. Nikki called 911 to report that she had just arrived at her house and found there was smoke inside and she was worried something was on fire and couldn't find her husband Chad. She told responding firefighters that the house was having furnace issues and they had been using a propane heater in the bedroom for warmth. When firefighters investigated the source of the smoke, they found there had been a fire in the bedroom and Nikki's husband Chad was deceased on the bed. Next to Chad was a shotgun, some empty liquor bottles, and by initial appearances, it looked as if Chad had committed suicide after drinking heavily and a fire had broken out due to the propane heater being left on. However, it didn't take long for parts of the scene to tell a different story. The most telling evidence was that Chad had been shot twice, a rarity in suicide attempts as one either completes the suicide in the first attempt or seeks help after the first attempt fails. While that alone would not rule out suicide, 
The shotgun used to inflict the fatal wounds on Chad was a side-by-side double-barrel shotgun. If Chad had shot himself twice with the weapon, both spent shotgun shells should have been left in the two chambers. However, one chamber held a spent shell casing while the other one had a live shell in it. In order for this to be a suicide, Chad would have had to have shot himself with a single round, emptied the spent shell, and then reloaded the chamber and pulled the trigger a second time. A series of events that made suicide even less likely. And so this is something we've talked about before. There's a lot of people that will commit a murder using a firearm that don't have a lot of firearm knowledge. And as a result, they'll make some major mistakes, as in this case. First off, I mean, it just the glaring issue is the, the two sh- gunshot wounds. As I've mentioned, it's normally the case if somebody's going to commit suicide, if they shoot themselves once and somehow that doesn't complete the suicide, it's pretty rare for somebody to shoot themselves a second time. I went to several dozen suicides by firearms over my law enforcement career and I can't recall a single one in which the person shot themselves twice. There were several that I went to where it wasn't completed after the first attempt and the person actually survived and there's several completed suicides I went to but never one where somebody shot themselves twice. So that in and of itself would have been a major clue to myself but then again it's this the setup of the shells, a double barrel shotgun, so there's two barrels side by side, and so if somebody's going to shoot themselves twice in a suicide attempt, if for some reason that first shot fails, they just have to pull the trigger a second time, which will fire the other barrel off, and then you'd have two gunshot wounds and two spent shell casings, one in each side of the chamber. But the fact that there was still a live shell casing in that shotgun at some point a spent casing had to be removed and a new one had to be inserted and i we're going to get into it but it definitely i think the hope was that whoever killed him thought the either the police or the coroner wouldn't notice the second gunshot wound and they thought it'd be more believable if it was just a single shot out of the shotgun so they set it up after the murder to look like a suicide Now, it also said in the reading that the shotgun was too far away from the victim for it to be a suicide. And I think it was on the bed, but it was just laying, uh, I guess, parallel to the body a foot or two away. And and again, this, this makes it look very staged. Every suicide that I went to... The gun ends up in a, in a weird angle, oftentimes resting on top of the person's body. If not, it's it falls either to the floor or, or again, it falls kind of half on the body, half off the body. The, the idea that this gun would just be laying along the side of the victim. Now, there have been times that I've gone to completed suicides by firearm where a family member has grabbed the weapon and moved it somewhere. And and in that case, obviously you can't discredit anything in regards to where the gun ends up because you just can't take it into account because you can't verify where the gun was after the suicide was completed. But in this case, it's very set up this way for the firefighters to discover the body and nobody else should have been in that house, according to Nikki Ensel. So the fact that the gun is laying in a spot where it shouldn't be, as if somebody had laid it there. Again, the, everything in this is going to look like a staged scene. And officers who have been to several suicides, have been to several homicides, uh, crime scene investigators, investigators that have been to these scenes will recognize the difference between a natural scene, just things they would expect to see, and a staged scene. And, and sometimes one item can be out of place and you can kind of attribute it to that's the one one in a million chance that the shotgun landed where it did, but if everything else about the scene lined up, if it had only been a single gunshot wound, uh, correctly having one spent shell casing in the chamber, other stuff we're not going to find out about later in the investigation didn't exist um, in this case. If, if this was set up differently, I guess, there's a chance that it could have been overlooked as a suicide, but 
we're going to find out that it's not just the staging, the multiple things you're seeing on site that don't add up to a suicide. It's, it's pretty clear early on that this is not a suicide, that it's a murder, and investigators are going to have to figure out who the killer is. And as the spouse is always the first suspect, investigators turn to what they knew about Chad and Nikki for answers. And Chad Insel was born on March 31st, 1977 in Halliday, North Dakota. He went to Halliday Public Schools, and after graduating high school, he went to a nearby college to study construction drafting. He loved sports, racing, and being outside. Chad volunteered as a Little League coach and spent the rest of his free time golfing, playing darts, bowling, and racing cars on a local track. And this is something you'll see, uh, it, it can happen in a big city as well, but a lot of these quote-unquote big cities in otherwise remote areas, whether it's a guy, uh, a guy or a gal, an adult will have a lot of these hobbies. Uh, a lot of times it's volleyball and bowling and darts and in this case golfing and racing cars. It just, it just seemed like Chad had a zest for life. He liked to stay busy. There was a lot of opportunities because this is a you know, quote-unquote urban area. I know when I say urban area, and people here, 134,000 people. If you're from a big city, you're thinking there's no way that that's an urban area. But if you've ever driven through North Dakota or South Dakota or parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, if you have a, a city of 134,000 people, a metro area, it is going to feel like a big urban area compared to the rest of the state. And then on May 21st, 2016, Chad married Nikki Heinz and took on responsibilities as being a stepfather to her two sons from a previous relationship. He was said to be a great stepfather, loved one, and friend to many, and was known for his kindness and generosity. Now, not much is reported on Nikki's background, but she did have a criminal past before they met. She was convicted for insurance fraud in South Dakota in 2012 and was subsequently arrested in Minnesota in 2014 for related charges after being deemed a fugitive from justice. And a fugitive from justice is usually an additional charge for somebody who has an out-of-state warrant. Uh, it, it's something where the law enforcement can charge and hold somebody. Uh, basically, it's, it's kind of for the inconvenience that they've put upon another state for fleeing from the state where they're wanted as a part of the criminal justice system of the other state. So oftentimes people will be arrested on a warrant from another state and then charged with being a fugitive from justice in the state that they're in. So that's what it sounds like. It was likely those 2012 charges. She was either supposed to appear for some warrant and didn't and was caught in Minnesota on this warrant and, and charged with fugitive from justice status. And then she was convicted of check fraud in South Dakota in 2014 and what we call financial transaction card fraud, so basically credit card fraud or debit card fraud in Minnesota in 2015. So before she meets Chad, she's obviously got some money issues. Now she does have two young sons that she apparently is raising on her own. Being a single parent can make things very tough money-wise, but as we're gonna see as we go on here, She's definitely motivated by money, and her crimes are motivated by money, so this could also be a thing where she just commits crimes because uh, she, not necessarily out of necessity, but out of greed. But by all accounts, after meeting Chad, the two appear to settle into their lives without much issue until late 2019. Investigators started looking at, into Nikki's cell phone records and located a man named Earl Howard. It was clear from the level of communication between Nikki and Earl that their relationship had a serious nature to it and the investigators assumed Nikki was having an affair with Earl. And apparently these two met because Nikki had a catering business or something and Earl had somehow been a client of hers. And when you're looking through somebody's cell phone records, when you're investigating them for potential a crime, if, if you're looking at a wife's cell phone records, you would expect to see a, a ton of calls and text messages to their significant other, their husband. You'd see potentially a lot of phone calls to family and relatives that live some distance away. They may have a close friend or two that they may be in contact with, but when you find a number that just jumps out of the paper, and, and when people are having an affair, it's almost 
like that puppy love. Well, it is like that puppy love phase, but it's times 10 because this is something new and it's something that is taboo. And so while you're in one relationship, you're, you're overcompensating for whatever's missing from that relationship by chasing down this new thing. So we're going to find out that this affair has been going on for at least a couple months, that it is it is extremely hot and heavy in terms of how much time Nikki and Earl are spending together. And again, that's not something that's easy to hide when police are looking at cell phone records unless you're using some type of a burner phone or, or second phone account that, that the police can't find. In this case, we're going to find out that Nikki doesn't cover her tracks at all. So police are going to have a lot of digital evidence in this case. And while an affair can be motive enough for a murder, investigators found that Nikki had a $600,000 life insurance policy out on her husband Chad, and his death would not only allow her to continue her relationship with Earl, it would give her a paycheck that she could use to start a new life, one she planned on starting in Texas with Earl. And so this is again, we talk about these investigations, every suspect needs, needs to be looked at under the MMO policy, so that's means, motive, and opportunity, or motive, means, and opportunity, however you want to say it. Basically, all three of those have to exist in order for this to be a strong suspect. Now, sometimes the motive is very difficult to find because there may be stuff going on in a husband and wife relationship that you don't know about, that, that is hidden, and so sometimes finding these motives can be difficult, but that's why investigators go through these phone records, they're finding this affair going on. There's motive number one. And just like in the Amy Mullis case out of Iowa, in that case, it was the, the victim that was having the affair. And that alone, again, can often be motive. But in that case, Todd Mullis was also found that if he had lost his wife through a divorce he was going to lose half of his family's farm as well so oftentimes you can have a singular motive and then it could be backed up by some form of financial motive and that's what they're finding here is again sometimes an affair can be enough but oftentimes if it's just the affair you will have defense attorneys that will say well that's what divorces are for if somebody wanted somebody out of their life they can get a divorce and move on. That doesn't mean that they have to murder their spouse just to separate. You know, people get divorced all the time. But when you throw divorce plus a $600,000 plus dollar payout to start a new life, then you're talking about motive on top of motive. And then you all you have to do is prove means and opportunity and we're going to they're going to have that very quickly here in this case. An investigator's next step was to find more evidence of the affair and plans to collect on the insurance and a life for Nikki and Earl after Chad's death. And thankfully for investigators, Nikki was a planner and left a trail of digital breadcrumbs for them to follow. The days before, during, and after Chad's death were full of indicators of Nikki's infidelity via online searches and applications and video evidence around town that proved Nikki and Earl were more than just acquaintances and were very strong suspects for the murder. On Thursday, December 26th, five days before Chad was murdered, Nikki went online to get a quote for renter's insurance. It was on that day that she called the company that she also received a quote from them and spoke via a recorded line with a salesman who started a $31,000 insurance account for her and a man named Earl Howard. She mentioned on the phone call that she and her daughter have matching earrings, but she doesn't have a biological daughter, but Earl does. Evidence was found showing that Nikki bought a pair of matching earrings in October of 2019 using her joint account with Chad. So we're going to see, again, there's going to be a lot of stuff that Nikki does before Chad is murdered or before she knows, is supposed to know that Chad is dead that indicates a lot of pre-planning about his murder, about how to cash in on his murder, and this is just another example of it. And for as much as the, these two are trying to commit the quote-unquote perfect crime, she's, she's not taking accounts out on herself, which you could almost justify later on just saying, hey, it was you know, after Christmas, it just got me thinking about how much 
valuable property we have in the house, it'd be a good idea to get some insurance on it. So I just secretly set up an insurance account for myself. She actually sets up the account for her and Earl together. So again, if you're trying to hide an affair or trying to hide the fact that you want a life with this man after your husband's dead, uh, pre-setting up a insurance account before your husband's even dead is with another man is probably not the best way. And this indicated to investigators that her relationship with Earl Har Howard was serious as of December 26 and had been serious for over two months. And they're, they're able to show that because she had talked on this recorded line, and we've talked about these recorded lines before. Uh, so police are able to get access to this recording where she's talking to the salesperson with the insurance company saying her and her daughter have matching earrings. And again, she doesn't have a daughter, she has two sons, but Earl has a daughter, and then they dig through bank statements and find that these two ear, uh, set of matching earrings have been purchased back in October. And there's gonna be some more references going back as far as October. So investigators are gonna know this is not something that just happened the, the week before. It's not something where they've just met and happened to be talking a lot. This is, this is a, at least a couple month long affair at this point. And for the week after Christmas, her sons were at their grandparents' house for winter break while both Chad and Nikki were supposed to be working. But receipts and security footage show that Nikki flew from Bismarck to Minneapolis on Friday, December 27th. Her text messages to Chad on this day indicated that she would be at work all day, but it would be later determined that her work denied she was scheduled to take part in any business travel. And there was proof that Earl was in the Minneapolis area at the same time she traveled via plane to the Minneapolis International Airport. Police obtained bank records that showed a joint account that Nikki and Earl opened at some point during their affair. That account showed purchases made by Earl in the Minneapolis area on December 27th. And, and again, we're talking about this case is just, it's all about the digital breadcrumbs. Uh, it's gonna be a ton of bank receipts. They have this joint account together. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen a situation where somebody's actively having an affair and they have a, a financial account with this other person. And there is gonna be some question as we go on here about how much Chad knew about his wife's infidelity. It almost seems as this, at this point as if they're on some type of a break or separation. I know she told a friend of hers that Chad and her didn't sleep in the same bedroom anymore. And that does happen, the quote unquote sleep divorce that can happen in, in relationships, whether the partner snores, whether one partner stays up really late, the other person goes to bed early and doesn't want to disturb their partner. Sometimes people just sleep better when they're in a bed alone. So th that can happen naturally. So I'm not reading a ton into that saying that they're under this separation or this divorce, but the amount of work that she's done to create this new relationship, it almost seemed like Chad and her from a, at least from an outside view, with everything she's doing, I would believe they are they were already under some form of agreed upon separation, but I don't think that's gonna be the case because there's nothing in the research that said that and the family didn't seem to think that that was going on, but unfortunately Chad's not around for us to ask him what he was, how much knowledge he had of this affair, or what was going on at this time. Now I will question, we're gonna see that she supposedly is at this work training for her work, which she leaves for on a Friday and I want to say they come back on Sunday together from, from this training. I don't know too many businesses, even in law enforcement, I don't know too many trainings that occurred over the weekend. Now maybe, I, I couldn't, she had this catering business, but I don't know if that's what this, where she actively worked. I couldn't find where she actively worked. I guess so maybe in the catering business, if you're doing weddings or major events you would be working weekends but most people don't quote unquote train on the weekends so it, it it definitely feels either she came up with a really great story about how she, she was going to be gone for the weekend for this work training and chad bought it or she somehow finagled but again middle of the week sure but the weekend after Christmas leading into New Year's is in a really popular time for somebody to host a training. So again, it just, a lot of this story doesn't make sense, especially if you're Chad, but again, I don't know how much he knew. 
And on Saturday, December 28th, Nikki texted a friend of hers named Michelle Mundy, telling her that she was in Minneapolis with her friend, quote unquote, Roy, which was Nikki's code name for Earl. Which, <laughs> if you're going to pick a code name, you think you'd pick a female code name? Because what difference is it if your husband finds out that you're with Roy versus Earl? That uh, Again, there's just so many parts of the story that just don't make sense or are just terrible planning on this part. You know, if I w had a significant other and I looked at their phone and saw that they were going to Minneapolis for the weekend to hang out with their friend Roy, it'd make no difference whether it was Roy, Earl, Bob, or Jim. I'm not going to be happy that my significant other is hanging out out of town for the weekend with another guy. But if it, her friend's name was Jenny or something like that, and she's going to go hang out with Jenny and have a girl's weekend, if every time she's talking to her to her friend and the code name is Jenny, it'd be harder for me to figure out that Jenny really means somebody else. I might might assume it, but I'm not going to be as upset immediately reading a text saying she's going to hang out with Jenny for the weekend than I would for Roy. So again, I, just more that doesn't make sense. Now, security footage and receipts show that Nikki and Earl shopped together at the Mall of America, but at the same time, Nikki was texting Chad claiming she was at her work training. And later that day, Earl and Nikki traveled together via Earl's truck to Bismarck. So she flies down to Minneapolis. They spend this Saturday together in the Minneapolis area. And he's from Canada originally. So this was likely, again, we're going to see all part of a plan. And for whatever reason, he doesn't fly to Bismarck. He flies to Minneapolis. Maybe that's just so they can have this shopping adventure together. And then they're going to travel from Minneapolis to Bismarck in his truck because she flew, you know, one-way ticket to, to Minneapolis. And they arrived back together in Bismarck at 1.52 a.m. on Sunday, December 29th. And Earl would check into the Staybridge Suites Hotel. At 1.59 a.m., security video captured them walking into the hotel together. A text message at 10.07 a.m. that morning from Nikki to Chad stated that Sunday would be her last day of training and around an hour later, Nikki and Earl left the hotel. At 1 p.m., they were captured on Walmart security videos and were seen kissing in the footage. They made purchases on their joint account before leaving. And Nikki would actually try to challenge this video in court saying, you can't really see them kiss. You see their heads come together, but she's, she denies that there was ever this affair between the two of them. And as you're going to hear about them going into a hotel together and coming out of a hotel together and going into a hotel and spending nights in a hotel together, it's pretty hard for anybody on the outside to believe that there wasn't a romantic relationship. And Earl is going to admit that there was an affair. Nikki's going to de deny it to this day. And even in court, I think she's or her lawyers are going to propose that this was just a kiss on the cheek and she does this with all of her friends, but it's going to be pretty damning evidence for the jury. At 4 p.m. that afternoon, they drove to the Bismarck Airport to pick up Nikki's car. And my guess is that you know this is potential evidence for them to show, for Nikki to show Chad at some point, that she had been on this work training and so... This is the reason it, she had to wait until now to get her car out. Because most people would say, why wouldn't you just drive when you first get back into town? Because you have to pay more the longer the car sits in, at airport parking. But my guess is if you, he were to see the receipt and see that she picked up her car at 1 a.m. On, on that Sunday, well, then it doesn't make sense that she's texting him later in the day saying that was her last day of training because she's already back in town. So my guess is they waited until the afternoon to go get it, so there's some proof there that she's just, quote-unquote, getting back into town at 4 p.m. But then they returned to the hotel before leaving to meet with Nikki's brother to give him presents to pass on to the boys. At 10.31 p.m., Chad texted Nikki telling her he's going to bed. And so... At this point, he has to be, again, wondering what's going on here. His wife was supposed to get back in the afternoon on Sunday from her work training. It's roughly six hours after she's supposed to be back in the Bismarck area, and she hasn't even come to the house yet. And these are the types of things that when somebody's going through an affair, they often don't think of this stuff or realize how this looks or feels to the other person and this is what really makes me question whether chad 
knew what was going on, whether there was some type of an agreement about a separation between the two of them, because otherwise, as far as we know, and the, the, I guess the police didn't release any of this stuff, but he has to be calling friends, family, saying, what the heck, you know, my I haven't seen my wife in three or four days. She's, she's supposedly at this work training. It would only take one call to her work to find out that this work training didn't exist. She's not where she's supposed to be. She's not coming home. So this is, again, Chad has to be questioning what's going on here or have knowledge of it. But either way, uh, he's going to text her saying he's going to bed. And Nikki and Earl made another trip to Walmart before retiring to the hotel for the evening at just before midnight. Now, Nikki would later say that she was staying at the hotel because they're having furnace issues in the home and this is january in the the middle of north dakota so it's going to be extremely cold and so she's going to tell investigators that she's voluntarily left the house to stay in a hotel so it is possible that she had told chad that until the furnace is fixed she was going to get a hotel room now again there's there's too many issues with that because what if Chad is like, yeah, I'm sick of sleeping in the cold too, and your boys are up with your, your with your parents, so I'm gonna come stay in the hotel room where it's warm too, and and Earl staying in the hotel room, like it just to me, there's too many things that don't make sense for this to be in a situation where Chad didn't know what was going on. But on the morning of Monday, December 31st at 7:21. A.M. Nikki called Chad and seven minutes later she drove to their house. She would later tell investigators that there was an argument over the furnace and Chad's drinking and she left for work shortly after arriving home. So this is the first time that we know of since Friday that she's had physical contact, been in the house with Chad and she's there for just a few minutes and then she leaves for work. I think roughly it was about a half hour I'd say. So enough time I guess to stop home maybe change your clothes maybe a shower and grab breakfast and you're out the door and at 7 53 a.m Chad left for work and Nikki took her lunch break on this Monday around noon and met up with Earl for an hour before returning to work and while Nikki was at work that afternoon Earl drove to a store and brought bought a welding torch kit before he returned to the hotel to wait for Nikki Nikki left work at 5.05 p.m. and drove to the hotel where she arrived at 5.24 p.m. And Chad got home from work at 5.06 p.m. and after a short wait he left for his Monday night bowling league at 5.46 and arrived at the bowling alley at 6 p.m. And this is where again I question, you know, your wife gets off work, she hasn't been home hardly at all since Friday and she's going to get off work at 5.05, they live about 10 minutes from where she works so you're likely expecting her to arrive at your house probably about 5 15 if she leaves work most days around 5 or a few minutes after 5 and you're not leaving for bowling till 5 46 so what are you thinking for that half hour thinking maybe you're going to see your wife before you head off to bowling but you don't because she's just drives straight to the hotel and at 6 38 p.m nikki texted chad to wish him luck with his bowling now this does seem out of place just based on everything that we've seen is there's not a lot of communication between her at least in a supportive or loving role so i took a step back when i saw this and thought there's got to be an ulterior motive here and i think what it is is she's going to wish him luck at bowling he's likely going to respond thanks you know whatever it might be and this is a confirmation for Nikki that Chad has actually gone to bowling because nine minutes later, which is likely when she received a response from Chad, Earl and her left the hotel to drive to the house and arrived at 6.54 p.m. And they began removing items from the home and this is all caught on a home video camera. The, 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 the house actually had a pretty decent security system to it, both with alarms on the doors and sensors that would tell you when the garage doors open and closed and then cameras all around the home so they're caught on camera removing a, a ton of items from the home they're there for like 90 minutes packing up stuff and leaving so they're grabbing a lot of Nikki's clothes they're grabbing a lot of valuable items out of the house and they left the house at 8 27 p.m. and Chad's not gonna leave the bowling alley till 10 22 that evening and he heads home 
And meanwhile, at the hotel, Nikki and Earl spent most of the evening unloading items that were taken from the house and loading them into the hotel room. And this is again where I question, if Earl comes home from bowling at say 10.30 at night, is he not gonna notice a whole bunch of stuff missing from the home? Now, if Nikki and him are sleeping in different bedrooms, maybe she has a lot of her clothes in this other bedroom, or she's got the main bedroom and he's got maybe a side bedroom. So maybe he's just exhausted at 10.30, comes home but and doesn't notice, but I think she took more than clothing. She took items of value out of the house. You'd think coming home, you'd, you'd think you were burglarized if you came home and a whole bunch of stuff is missing from your house. And so again, is, is this indicating that there was some type of a separation or did she maybe let him know at some point, like, hey, I'm running out of clothes at the hotel, I'm gonna swing by and pick up a few things, but picking up a few things and cleaning out half the house, taking 90 minutes to move stuff out, to me would look very different. And, and they took enough stuff that it took them a while to unload it from the truck into the hotel room as well. So to me, coming home, I would realize a lot of stuff from my house is missing, something's up. But we don't have any record of, or at least the police didn't release any information about any conversation between Chad and Nikki after he got home. And at 12.35 a.m., Nikki's login information was used to access the home security system multiple times. And it's later believed she was shutting off the security cameras and trying to erase earlier footage. So to me, it sounds like they must have had some type of an app or internet login where they could access the camera systems and the alarm systems and that kind of stuff remotely so they didn't have to be on site and so it appears that somebody was using Nikki's login information to access this remotely and then she was trying to shut off the security cameras for what's about to happen and she's trying to I think she tried to erase earlier footage because some of the footage that's going to be captured is corrupted but she either didn't know how or failed to erase the video that where they were there earlier in the evening removing all these items. And at 1.02 a.m., Earl and Nikki left the hotel, and nine minutes later, the garage door at the Ensel home opened. So they were successful in shutting the cameras down, but they weren't able to turn off the sensors, at least on the garage door. So the police are going to be able to see when, on the security system records, this garage door opens and closes. And after... Arriving at 1.02 a.m., the garage door closes an hour and 45 minutes later at 2.56 a.m. And she would later tell investigators that she had just stopped home to grab some medicine, and then she changed her story to taking care of some household chores in the middle of the night. And we've talked about this at length. When a suspect is caught or when a cheating spouse is caught in an affair, our minds try to make up a story, and the stories can be believable to us, but you know, her first story of, I'm just stopping by to pick up some medicine, the, the investigators are quickly going to say, you were there for an hour and 45 minutes. How much medicine do you need to pick up? Or, or what, you know, what medicine did you need to pick up that took you an hour and 45 minutes? Well, then they quickly realize, yeah, picking up medicine is going to take two or three minutes. I have to account for another hour and 42 minutes of time. Oh, I was doing some chores. I think she said she was loading the dishwasher and doing some other stuff, which again, she hasn't been at the house in almost four days other than her quick stop before work. It, it makes very little sense for her to be there and doing household chores. And then she's doing it at one o'clock in the morning when her husband's sleeping and they both have to work the next day. So none of this again makes sense to investigators. And so they're going to continue to watch the, the, the security footage. They find she arrives back at the hotel at 3.16, and Earl arrives exactly one hour later at 4.16 a.m. And her login information was used again to access the security system at 5.54 a.m., and then 30 minutes later, Earl left the hotel, and five minutes later, the garage door opened at the house. This time, somebody was inside for six minutes before the garage door closed again. And just before 8 a.m., Nikki called Chad's workplace and told them he wasn't coming in as he wasn't feeling well. And this call for a sick day, sick day would buy them 48 hours as his work was closed on January 1st for New Year's Day. And then Nikki attended her work day. And they would return to the Ensel home later that evening at 11.15 p.m. to start the fire a second time to try and destroy evidence of the murder. A cigarette butt matched a brand smoke 
by Earl was found near the propane heater, likely used as a delayed ignition device. Arson investigation dogs alerted the presence of accelerant used in the bedroom. So this is something you'll see in either some type of an action movie or these, these delayed ignition devices can work. It can be as simple as a cigarette butt that's lit on fire and then put into a matchbook that's set on top of a, a bunch of accelerant. It gives the, the cigarette butt's going to burn for a minute or so and then that's going to ignite eventually the matchbook which is going to ignite the accelerant so it gives you some time to get away from the fire and some people will use this in establishing an alibi but what they don't realize is oftentimes this stuff is left behind at a scene it doesn't completely burn and so they're going to, you're going to actually leave evidence of the delayed ignition device behind which is an automatic clue that it's arson and it's not just a faulty propane heater or something along those lines. Now on New Year's Day, Earl and Nikki went to a jewelry store to purchase some jewelry and obtain some insurance documents. And I found this kind of odd and then I realized if you're trying to if you're eventually going to try to maximize your insurance claim, you likely have to have some evidence of what you lost in that fight. You can't just tell your insurance company I had a $15,000 wedding ring. Uh, they're going to want some documentation to show that you had purchased this at some point, that the item was worth that, and that then you can claim it and it, you're missing. So they actually make two trips to this jewelry store, and it said they purchased some jewelry, but they also obtained some in insurance documents. So again, this is just that further digital slash paper breadcrumb trail that's that's pointing towards pre-planning for the fraud, pre pre-planning for the arson and capitalizing on on the arson and the murder from a monetary standpoint. And on Thursday, January 2nd, Nikki got to work around 7.39 a.m. By 9 a.m. she had received seven call, calls from a co-worker of Chad's as he hasn't shown up for work and no one had called him in sick. He wasn't answering the co-worker's calls or texts and they were getting worried. And now this prompted Nikki to call Earl, and shortly after she spoke with Earl, she got four more calls from the coworker, and she left work shortly after the calls and immediately called Earl again. Another one of Chad's coworkers called Nikki at 9.42, prompting her to call Earl again at 9.43. She finally answered the phone call from the second coworker, but she told him that she was busy. So this is what happens when a plan goes wrong. My, I don't get how they didn't, think that this was going to happen that the they had called him sick the in sick the one day either she she could have easily answered the call from the first co-worker and said oh yeah it's it's a three-day flu he still doesn't feel like coming into work he's sleeping he was up all night throwing up whatever whatever it might be but it, it, it's clear that she's kind of in a in a panic mode at this point like they hadn't really thought of what they're going to do by by this last day now granted they were hoping the whole house would burn down and somebody would notice and they wouldn't have to go through three days of, of making him disappear but it, it's clear that they in all of their planning they didn't come up with a plan for what do we happen on on his second day of work that he's going to miss and people start to notice and the co-workers concerned by nikki's disinterest in chad's welfare contacted the police themselves for a welfare check Officers checked the Ensel residence, but it was secure with no signs of damage or forced entry, and they couldn't see into the bedroom because it was on the second floor. Again, something we've talked about before. Officers are going to arrive at a home for a check welfare. They're going to knock on the door. They're going to look at all the, the windows and doors. Everything's intact. Uh, there's no forced entry. An adult can choose to skip work. If they decide to skip work, there's nothing illegal about it, and they're not going to it's not like they can look in through the first floor windows and see Chad in the bed. Uh, he's on the on the second floor, so nothing at that time looks suspicious to the officers, so they clear from the check welfare. Now at 10.45 a.m., Nikki's going to Google a local funeral home, and this was seven hours before she dis quote-unquote discovered the house fire and firefighters located Chad deceased. So again, her digital breadcrumbs are telling investigators that at 10.45 a.m. on January 2nd, she already knows Chad is dead. But she's not going to make that 911 call until 5.20 that afternoon, where supposedly at that point, firefighters are going to go in and discover Chad dead. So at trial, they're definitely going to bring this up, saying, 
either you're the, the world's best and most accurate psychic knowing your husband's already dead and going to be dead later that day or you already had knowledge that he was dead if you're googling funeral homes nobody just sits around on a, a, during a work day and Googles funeral homes unless somebody in their family has recently been deceased. It's just not something we think about. And Nikki made her first attempt to contact Chad that day at 2.22 p.m. And this was despite the concerns raised by the coworkers earlier that morning. And at 3.33 p.m. she returned to work, but she hadn't gone home during the day to check on Chad. So <laughs> again, at some point this is panic and then her and Earl must have come up with this, well, you, you better at least call Chad to check on him if, if these coworkers, because if the police see that you don't even call him, that's going to look even more suspicious. But she waits until 2.22 in the afternoon. So this is five hours after she's been getting these calls from these coworkers. And then she doesn't live far from work, but she does leave work. So most people, if, if you were worried about your spouse, the five ten minute drive from work if you've already left there to go check on the house at that point would look a lot less suspicious than you leaving work with the knowledge that your husband didn't show up for work that day and not even checking the house so she left work at 5 p.m and that's when at 5 20 she contacted 911 to report the smoke in the house and nikki told investigators that chad was an abusive drunk but several people close to the couple said that while chad did drink he was able to control his drinking and when he got drunk he was more giggly than angry so we you all have your friends and and i put them into three categories when my friends get drunk they're one of three things they're the happy giggly drunk they're the difficult pain in the butt drunk or they're the angry drunk and there are people that are angry drunks and cannot handle alcohol they turn into complete monsters and everybody knows somebody like that but then everybody knows they like said the person who's just difficult they're not angry or violent they're just a difficult person they just become stubborn and obtuse when they get drunk but then you have your you know just the world is happy and giggly drunks as well and that's what it sounds like chad was so there was no evidence he didn't fight with his friends when he got drunk he didn't fight with strangers when he got drunk he was just this laid-back happy guy when he got drunk so her claims that he was abusive didn't make sense to anybody else investigators talked to several of the couple's friends and found out that nikki had texted one of her friends that she wanted to divorce chad and move to texas with earl and the boys so again well before this murder takes place she's already has these plans she set up bank accounts she's done insurance plans all the stuff and on january 4th nikki's forwarded an email to earl about houses for sale and i believe this same day she contacted uh, chad's work to inquire about additional life insurance that he possibly had a lot of employers offer life insurance for their employees and i think it was something like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar policy that the employer had for chad so she's looking at three quarters of a million dollars in life insurance and so she starts to inquire that on that i think it was on january 4th and on january 6th and 7th earl and nikki called each other over 23 times those two days as investigators looked even further back in time they found that earl had made numerous stays at the hotel over the previous months and this was further evidence of a long-standing relationship between earl and nikki but when nikki was initially asked if she was having an affair with earl she told investigators that earl wasn't her type they interviewed and interrogated nikki for six hours what began as an interview of a grieving spouse who had lost her husband turned into one with a woman who was obviously having an affair and eventually admitted she was okay with the fact that her husband was dead and finally it turned into an interrogation of a co-conspirator in his planned murder in the end nikki would claim chad died when earl and him got into a fight when she went to get medication from the house on january 30th she said she wasn't having an affair with earl and that he was just a friend who was helping her out because the furnace in the house was acting up and she was sick of being cold and wanted a warm place to stay but investigators would learn from two different furnace technicians that they had done service checks on the furnace twice in December and only noted small issues and nothing that would affect the overall function of the furnace. So this makes me believe that if there were furnace issues, it was possibly Nikki manipulating the furnace to create reason for her to be out of the house for extended periods of time for these stays at the hotel with Earl. And that's my guess is that, 
you know, she's manipulating, turning off the furnace, messing it up somehow, shutting off the pilot light. The house is getting cold. She's complaining. Chad's making these calls to service technicians. They're coming out and saying, there's nothing wrong with this furnace. Getting it, you know, relit, set back, whatever it might be. Then whenever she needs time away again, she manipulates the furnace and just becomes this built-in excuse. Well, then that's the reason why they need a propane heater, which is a fire hazard. Again, it, to, to an investigator, this is all pre-planning to set up eventually what they what they carry out in this murder. And authorities located and arrested Earl Howard on January 9th as he tried to flee into Canada via Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So he's actually arrested at the border crossing. And in October of 2021, a plea agreement was made between Earl Howard and prosecutors. He agreed to plead guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit murder, arson, conspiracy to commit arson, and other lesser charges in exchange for a 25-year prison sentence of which he was required to spend 21 years behind bars. This plea agreement was approved by Chad's family, and while it wasn't as strong as they would have liked, the prosecutors explained to the family that a murder charge would be hard to get because there's no way to prove who pulled the trigger and killed Chad. The gun had been tested and no evidence proving who shot the shotgun was located. So they likely swabbed the trigger uh, and dusted for prints, swabbed different parts of the, the shotgun and the shotgun shells to see if they could put that gun into either Earl or Nikki's hands because if they can prove who actually pulled the trigger and killed Chad, that person can go on trial for murder. And they, they have a very strong murder case. They've got all the security footage up evidence they've got the uh, security system evidence we've got the evidence of the affair the evidence of the uh, attempt to monetize the the crime so they've they've got everything what they don't have is proof of who actually pulled the trigger and so convincing the jury because this is another one of those situations you have two suspects so when you get to trial if you take to trial you're going to have the finger pointing you're going to say yes i was along but he pulled the trigger, or yes, I was alone, but she pulled the trigger. And if you don't have evidence of it, the jury is going to have to try to make a decision based on no evidence of who actually pulled the trigger. And there's a chance that you could get a mistrial or even an acquittal on a murder charge for a crime that you know was committed by both parties. You just can't prove who actually pulled the trigger. And in reality, both of them could have. One, that's how they could end being shot twice. But the, the long and short of it is the, the prosecution has to come to the family and say, look, we can't try this for murder. It's There's a chance we could lose. He's going to take this plea agreement. He's going to spend 21 years behind bars. Whether or not he pulled the trigger, he was involved in the crime, 21 years minimum service is, is a pretty good sentence. It's the best that we're going to get without potentially losing this at a trial. And the family went and agreed with the prosecution. However, Nikki is going to opt to take her chances at the trial. She was standing by her story that Earl shot Chad while she was outside, so she had she was not involved in the murder. She wasn't plan, planning to murder Chad, and she didn't feel that the investigators had sufficient evidence to actually convict her of any crimes. And Nikki's trial began on September 27, 2022, and lasted six days. After six days of testimony and evidence, the jury took only two hours to deliberate before returning and finding Nikki guilty of all counts. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 36 years. And in the end, most people point to life insurance money as the motive for the murder. Nikki could have left Chad for Earl and moved to Texas with her boys. They were not Chad's biological sons, so she would not have had a custody fight but she needed money to start a new life, and the only way she could get that money was if Chad was dead. And, and this is where sometimes you don't have to have money to be a motive for a spouse to kill. There's, if there's children involved and there's gonna be child custody, it's gonna get messy. There's gonna be child support or alimony or, or something along those lines. That can be a motive as a part of the affair or the impending divorce for their just just as i mentioned with the the todd and amy mullis case out of iowa there's when an impending divorce is going on with an affair and there's potential for a loss of a large amount of value in the, in the marriage then you can have that issue but in this case nikki could have left 
Chad on a clean break and headed to Texas with Earl, there was there was nothing stopping her from doing it because they weren't Chad's boys. So if she wanted this new life, it's as simple as filing for divorce and packing up your stuff and, and moving down to Texas with Earl. But uh, she, they needed the money. They needed that life insurance. So Chad needed to be dead for their plan to work. And so that's why people point to the life insurance as more of a motive than the actual uh, the affair and the new relationship. And her greed for money was further evidenced by her attempt to file an insurance claim for the renter's insurance policy she had taken out just days before the fire. She phoned in a claim days after Chad's death, claiming her possessions had been lost in a house fire, but investigators were able to determine all the items she claimed were lost were items that she had removed from the house while Chad was bowling. And again, she thought she had deleted the video of the two of them removing all these items from the house. So her perfect plan is Chad's death looks like a suicide, the house burns down, she's able to collect on the $31,000 worth of lost items when she rea in reality she gets to keep these items so she banks an extra 31000 which is really just greed on top of greed if she's looking at getting $750,000 from from the two life insurance policies but $31,000 is $31,000 and it's just just more proof of how money motivated her and so greed and love are two motives for murder and they both apply in this story Thankfully, the suspect's plan did not work out as they had hoped, and while they are enjoying a similar life together, it's from behind bars in different prisons. But that's the case of Chad Ensel, our North Dakota flyover country case. Thank you everyone for listening. Stay tuned for future episodes, and feel free to write me at TrueBlueCrimeProductions at gmail.com. You can also find me at TrueBlueCrimeProductions on Facebook, and support me via Patreon, PayPal, at TrueBlueCrimeProductions. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Goodbye.